The exact hyperparameter settings of a deep feedforward neural network can make the model or break the model. So in this video, we will learn about what each of these hyperparameters mean, how they work, and also how to implement them using Keras and Python. I always like working with visualizations, so that's why I made this diagram to show you where in the training life cycle of neural networks each hyperparameter belongs. So in this network, how everything works is that we get a data set that is a subset of the whole data set that we have. It's a one batch. And with this batch, the network, the output of the network is calculated using this equation. And based on that, a loss is calculated based on the loss function that we have. It could be a bit different. And based on the optimization algorithm and the learning rate that we said, we calculate how much the weights and biases, so the parameters of the network, should be updated. So I want to start with number of neurons in the input layer and number of neurons in the output layer. Number of neurons in the input layer is going to be determined based on your data. So if you have 10 features in your data set, you're going to have, need to have 10 different input neurons in your input layer. If you have an image, let's say a 20 to 20 pixel image, you're going to need to have 400 of these input neurons. So the number of neurons in your input is going to be determined based on your data. Whereas the number of neurons in your output layer again, is going to depend on your data, but this can change a little bit and you can kind of tweak it and change it based on your problem. So let's say uh, what you're doing is a binary classification. You can either have only one output neuron where it, if it outputs something closer to zero, that means it's the, it's one class. If it outputs something close to one, that's the other class. So you can tweak it a little bit and change it based on your preferences. If you have four different classes that you want to classify things into, then it's probably better to have four different neurons. Or if you are trying to do regression, for example, then you're probably good, you're probably good with just one output neuron. All right, let's see how we can do this in Keras. So it's quite simple to create a model with Keras. This is basically the wrapper of a neural network. You're saying that you want to create a sequential neural network. And what we're going to do is to fill it inside with the different types of layers that we want in there. So the first layer that I want in there is the input layer. So I'm going to create it in a new line. Let's say I'm working with image data that is 28 to 28. So what I can do in my input layer is to say that my input shape is going to be 28 to 28. And what I want to happen is to flatten this and create 784 neurons in my input layer. It is quite simple to create layers with Keras. You can call different types of layers. Flatten is the one where if you have a matrix of values that it flattens it to be one long array. And we will see about the other layers in a second. Whereas to create a output layer, what I'm going to do is to create a layer that's called a dense layer. And I can add as many neurons as I want in there. If, as I said, I'm doing a regression problem, then I can just have one neuron out there. If I am trying to classify these images into four different categories, then I can have four of them. And what else I need to specify here is the activation function uh, of this layer. So for now, I can say I want this to have a softmax activation function. So as you can see, it's actually quite straightforward. So the next thing to decide is the number of hidden layers and number of neurons in the hidden layers. This is not determined based on the data like we did in the number of uh, neurons in the input layer and the output layer, because it's going to depend on how complex of a network you need for the specific problem. The more complex of a problem that you have, the deeper you want your network to be. And you might also want to improve or in increase the number of neurons in your hidden layers. One rule of thumb though, is that if you need more complexity, if, you, if your model is underfitting, for example, it's always better to add more layers before adding more neurons to the layers. Like we talked about in the output layer, actually the hidden layers also can take the shape of dense layers. So if you want to add a hidden layer, what you need to do is in between the input and the output layer, you just need to add more layers. So let's say I want to add three layers. And if you want to change the number of neurons that are in these layers, you can just add a number in there. And then that means that you are adding neurons in these hidden layers. And this is basically how you determine the number of hidden layers and number of neurons in your hidden layers.
So the next thing that we want to set up is the activation function. The activation function can be different for all the layers of the network. So you do not have to set one activation function for the whole network. One really important point here is that the hidden layers cannot take linear activation functions because if you do a linear activation, what you're, what's going to happen is that your input is going to be equal to your output. And at the end of the day, your neural network is not going to be more than a simple, simple linear transformation of your input. But we want something more complicated than that. So that's why in hidden layers, we use other activation functions like softmax, sigmoid, or relu, or hyperbolic tangent function. But for the output layer, you can use linear transformation. So let's say if you're doing a regression, then maybe you actually want a, a raw number. So in that case, a linear activation function will be fine. And setting the activation function in your layers is quite simple. So all you have to do is go to your dense layers and then set the activation to the name of whatever you want it to say. So let's say for these ones, we use ReLU. For another layer, you might want to use the hyperbolic tangent function. You might use ReLU again. Or for example, for the last layer, maybe the output layer, you want to use a softmax function. So depending on your problem, the output activation function would again uh, change. So you have to decide what kind of output that you're looking for based on your problem and then decide the activation function of the uh, output layer. Next, let's look into the weight initialization technique. So before anything happens in this network, we have to set up the parameters, right? So biases most of the time are set to be zero and then they're updated during the training. But we cannot set the weights to be zero because if we do that, what's going to happen is that the weights, all of the weights are going to be updated in the same way and we're not going to be able to achieve the complexity that we want through this deep forward neural, feed forward neural network. So that's why there are different types of uh, ways or techniques that you can use to initialize your uh, weights on your network. And we talked about this before actually in the weight initialization techniques video. So if you want to learn more about that, go ahead and check that video. It is quite simple to set the weight initializer. All you have to say is kernel initializer to whatever name of the initializer that you like to choose. You can go and check out the kernel initializer list on the Keras website and see what options you have. Let's say you want to do it with the hey, the initializer with the normal distribution. Um, the default value for this, if you don't set anything else, is the Glorod uniform initializer, just so you know. But if you want to set it to something else, as we talked about in the weight initialization video, also based on your activation function, then you have to specify it separately. Another thing that you can do is to use a regularization technique. So this is kind of like a branched out sort of um, hyperparameter because you can either use or not use regularization and you can use different types of regularization techniques. And inside the type of regularization technique that you use, there is another hyperparameter called alpha. So you might need to decide that, or if you're using a different regularization, this could be called dropout rate, but it will have in itself some other hyperparameters that you might need to tune. Um, regularization is basically what we do to stop the network from overfitting. If you want to learn more about it, if you want to learn more about the different techniques, again, go and check out our video on regularization. It is quite simple to how we set the initializer. Again, we say kernel regularizer, a little bit of a hard word. <laughs> One way to call it is by using the name. So if you want to use L1 or L2, L2 regularization, you can say L1 or L2. Another way to do that, if you want to specify the alpha parameter that we talked about, is to call a function from the Keras library. So simply say Keras regularizers L2 and then specify the alpha parameter. Or if you want to use um, more than one regularizer, let's say you want to use L1 and L2, what you can do is again call kernel, or set that kernel uh, regularizer parameter and then set keras regularizers. Oh, I made a mistake here. L1 underscore L2. And then if you want to set the alpha parameters, simply you just need to say L1 for example. There is another way to use regularization that's called the dropout regularization. And to use dropout regularization, you just need to create a whole new layer in between the layer that you uh, want to use the regularization for and the next layer. And we're going to call 
the dropout layer for this dropout regularization. And I just need to specify the rate at which I want the dropout to happen. After completing the architecture of the network that you want, what we need to do is call two other um, Keras functions to compile and then train this model. And the rest of the hyperparameters will be determined inside these two functions. So let's see what those are. The next thing that we want to do is to set the loss function. And again, this will be determined based on the type of problem that you have. There are a bunch of different options in the Keras documentation. You can see all the alternatives. I will leave a link to all the Keras documentation also in the description below. And basically you can go and read and based on the type of problem that you have, you can see which one is appropriate for your problem. What we need to do is just go inside the compile function and then set the loss function that we want. So one example could be sparse categorical cross entropy. This loss function is used when you have two or more different labels that you're trying to classify your input into. But as I said, go and check out the documentation to see based on your problem, what kind of loss function that you need to use. So next we have the optimization algorithm. The optimization algorithm is the thing that determines how we should update the weights of the network or the parameters of the network to achieve better performance in the next round. The most commonly used optimization algorithm is the stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it is also the default value in Keras, but there's also many other different um, functions that you can use that is already built in in the Keras library. There are two different ways how you can set the uh, model optimizer. So one way is to just call optimizer and then the string name of the, the function that you want to use, a string name of the optimizer that you want to use. So if you want to use gradient descent, SGD is the term that you should use. But there's another way how we can do this. So instead of saying SGD, you can also call like we did in the Keras regularizers, instead of just calling the string name, is to call a Keras optimizers. And let's say this time we wanna use Atom. And the advantage of this one is now that, now that you specify the um, optimization algorithm that you want to use in by calling the Keras function, you can now specify the learning rate that you want, like we did in the regularizers too, right? When we use just a string name, that's all you can determine every for everything else, the default value is used. But if you want to specify the alpha, you need to call the Keras regularizers L2, like specifically like that. And same here, if you want to set the learning rate inside this optimizer, you have to call it through the Keras function. So, and then what you can do is to just set the learning rate to whatever you want. So now we've seen how to set up the optimization algorithm and the learning rate. There are different ways how you can set the learning rates. For example, you can do learning rate scheduling, but that's a little bit more complicated and that will make this video very long. So I will make a separate, whole separate video for learning rate scheduling. So now that we've seen how to set up the architecture of the network and also what kind of loss function to pay attention to and also what kind of procedure to use to update the parameters of the network, the next thing that we want to look at is the training, the actual training process of the network. And for that, we're going to look at the batch size, so the number of data points that we use and the number of iterations. So how many times do we run the whole data set through the network? So batch size basically tells us how many different groups to divide the data set into. So it says how many data points needs to be in one of these subgroups. So let's say we have a data set with a thousand data points. If we set the batch size to be 500, that means we will have two batches in total. So let's say in this example here, we have a thousand data sets, a sorry, a thousand data points and we, divide, we make the batch size to be 250. So that's why we have four batches. How learning happens in a deep neural network is that we take one batch, so in this example, 250 data points, and we run it through the network. We calculate the output, we calculate the error, and then we, using the optimization algorithm and the learning rate, we update the weights of the network. And then we do the same thing for the next batch. So we run the whole batch through the network, we calculate the output, and then the error and update the weights. And when you do it four times with four different batches, that means you have done one epoch. So you have completed one iteration over the network. So an epoch means running the whole data set through the network once. 
So that's why the number of iterations or epochs are different than the number of batches that we have. So now let's see how we can set it in Keras. Inside the fit function, what we first need to do is of course to give our network uh, the data set, right? The X train and Y train. And on top of that, you can set the batch size to be whatever you want. Normally, smaller batch size, the better. Um, there has been some work done into showing that larger batch sizes could actually work and uh, produce good results. But generally, we use small batch sizes from 2 to 64. So let's say we use a batch size 32 in this case. And most of the time, we use the increments of 2 because of how the computer is, our computers are built. So that's why, you know, because of the binary nature of computers, we opt for uh, batch sizes that are increments of two. And here, this is also where we set the epoch. So we can set the epoch to be whatever you want, really. We can set it to be 30. And if you run your network and you realize that your network is underfitting, you can increase the epoch to be whatever number that you want and then evaluate again. Another thing, even though it's not a hyperparameter, is to uh, set the validation data inside the fit function. So what you need to do is uh, if you separate it a validation data set separately before in your uh, data preparation phase, you can include them here. So these are basically the main hyperparameters of a network. As you've seen, some of them are going to depend on the data that you're using. And some of them are going to depend on the other hyperparameter settings. So for example, um, the activation function that you're using is going to affect the weight initialization technique that you use. So there could be some interdependencies in between your uh, hyperparameters. And some hyperparameters are going to be trial or error and basically seeing what works better for your problem. So for example, the batch size or number of iterations. But no matter what you're doing, always make sure to check the documentation of the library that you're using and with the basic information that you got with this video today, I'm sure you'll be on your way to create your first neural network in a confident way. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you liked it, don't forget to give us a like and maybe even subscribe to show your support. We would also love to hear from you in the comment section below with any of your questions or comments. And before you leave, don't forget to go get your free API token for Assembly AI using the link in the description. Thanks for watching again and I will see you in the next video.